Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a game show testing your patience for listening to chatter about statistics. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and we're in a lecture about critical race theory. I'm fervently pointing at a number of graphs, and in front of me, napping, is Bart. How's it going, Bart? Hey, how's it going? I go by he and him, and to be honest, I think I came to the wrong class. I was hoping to improve my uh, go-karting skills. <laughs> Well, you see, those races are considered non-critical here. If it was Formula <laughs> One, on the other hand, we do have a cooperative arrangement with engineering. So today we're doing the second in a short series about how you can get extra information about an outcome that interests you based on what else you know about possible inputs. In episode 31, we talked about a situation where you have multiple covariates that affect an outcome. So you have the outcome you care about, and you have a bunch of stuff that goes in there, and we call these covariates. Oh, let's say it's A, B, and C down here. Because nothing is easy in the real world, we're going to look at a situation where these inputs have their own relationships. So let's say that somewhere between A and B, there is something going on, some relationship. And that relationship also feeds into the outcome that we care about. Mm -hmm. This does happen particularly in such complex situations as social structures. Our case study for the episode is what's known as intersectional feminism, a body of feminist theory that came out of black feminist criticism of how the white middle-class feminist movement wasn't able to represent their experience or interests, and for how a lot of black rights movements, some of which were male-dominated, weren't able to represent the particular experiences that black women had. Our kind of classic example as a result of that is going to be like the experience of black people and white people and the experience of men and women and overlaps between the two. I'm just going to draw a quick Venn diagram here to really take you back to uh, high school. So we call this intersectional feminism. Wow, those are incredible circles today, aren't they? Because if we have black people here and women here, this is the intersection, the overlap between the two, which is black women. And we are thinking of that in, the, in a context where we are looking at like structures of power and social relationships, right? So in this sort of environment, what we are imagining, uh, and I'm going to talk about evidence around this in a little while, is that different levels of like power and inequality are unsurprising, I know. So we have uh, gender structures in patriarchy, we have structures of race in white supremacy, and black women experience the overlap of the two of these. So let's imagine that you have some outcome of interest. We're going to say it's wealth for the second. And we've got our four groups. We've got white men, white women, black men, and black women. And obviously I am oversimplifying this. I am talking about some abstract metric of wealth. I'm not doing this from real data, but this is a demonstration of the sort of logic here. So if we have white men having a level of, <laughs> wow, having a level of wealth that's about here, White women having a level of wealth that's here. So we've got this much gap, which we would think of as the gender gap. And then we have black men sitting at some other level. I would put that a little further down, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my, my uh, tablet's a little bit sideways. <laughs> so we have a gap here between white men and black men, which is race. What we see is that instead of just having... And now this is going to really sort of fuck up my perspective here. Instead of having your gender gap a bit bigger, your race gap kind of added together, black women actually experience a further gap here, which is kind of the interaction between being women and thus disadvantaged by patriarchy and being black and thus disadvantaged by a structure of white supremacy. So this is kind of the gender race interaction. And it is, for a statistician, an interaction, right? Which, to me, or to st statisticians, means we have two things that are kind of working together to provide an additional outcome on top of what you see from each of them independently. What I mean by that is, here is your gender gap, here, independent of race, here is the race gap, when it is independent of gender, but when you combine the two, you get an extra gap. There is an additional impact that's a result of having both that you see for black women that you do not see among white women or black men in these structures of, of power and wealth. Now, we can also add 
more variations to this. So this is very, very like simplistic. Uh, we've had recent discussions about ideas of uh, racial structure and things. So obviously these categories I have problems with, but they are social categories that exist. They are not the only ones. And you can look at other stuff. So you could add more variables, whether someone is cis or trans, whether they are disabled, whether they are rich or poor. I mean, we're looking at wealth as an outcome here, but you can also look at it as an input for something else. As long as we have a, a sort of measurable statistical situation, we can test whether this sort of structure exists. We can test whether this additional little bit actually exists or not for a particular variable that's your output, for some variables that are your input. We have quite rigorous ways to look at this in a quantitative setting. The original ways that this was researched, it was more qualitative. Kimberly Crenshaw, who is the person who came up with the um, term intersectional feminism or intersectionality to describe these overlapping systems of power and inequality, she was looking at it in a context of like law scholarship and like she worked on the Anita Hill um, legal team, for example. So that's the sort of stuff that she was looking at. And so she was talking about kind of disparate outcomes in law where the experiences and interests of black women were not represented by black men and their advocacy for black people or white women and their advocacy for women. There is a quantitative side to it that I'm going to be talking about from a statistical perspective, but there's also a lot of qualitative evidence in support of this sort of stuff as well. All right, now we're going to get to the annoying mathematical bit. So how this works is that you take your preferred outcome, we'll go with wealth, and you say that it is equal to some combination of the input variables. So we're going to put a baseline, which I'll talk about in a second, which is what you are taking to be your kind of thing that you are comparing to. We have a gender effect. We have a race effect. Well, this is effect. I forgot that word. And we have the gender dash race effect which is the little bit that, or, or can be quite large, the bit that you put at the end when you are like thinking about this. This is the interaction term to a statistician. You can structure this model with any baseline you like. So the baseline is the group that you are comparing the others to. The underlying maths is the same, but it's easiest to interpret this if you pick either your presumed most or least advantaged group. For us, that's going to be white guys. So our baseline represents white men. In this case, the baseline would actually be the top line? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that is an assumption we are making. You can check whether or not that is actually the case when you have evidence. I'm going to talk about what that would look like. So the race effect is about changing the race category and like represents black people in general. And the gender effect is about changing the gender variable and we would represent women. Now, obviously I have some opinions about whether or not this is binary, but we're going for a simplistic model here in order to represent it properly. How we represent these mathematically is that we wind up with what are called indicator variables. So I'm going to put a little i, g here, which gets multiplied by the gender effect. And it is equal to one when you have a, a woman or women that you're looking at and zero if the people you're looking at are men. So what that means is that if you are interested in women, this gets multiplied by one. So you actually see the gender effect. If it's multiplied by zero because you're looking at men, you get zero here. And it goes away. Yep. Next, we have the race effect, which similarly gets a indicator variable for race. I'm going to put a little plus there. And our indicator variable for race, similar idea. Uh, gets one for black people and zero for white people. If you're looking at the wealth of black people, you put a one here, multiplied by the race effect. So this actually shows up. If you're looking at white people, you put a zero there and it goes away. Mm -hmm. Now, when we come to the gender race effect, we don't actually need another variable because what we can do, oops, I need a plus there, is we can put the indicator variables multiplied by each other. So we have the race indicator variable and the gender indicator variable, and I'm running out of space, but we multiply these things together. 
hidden little multiplications in there, I promise. <laughs> so what we get out of that is kind of input data that looks like a bunch of zeros and one. So our white men will look like zero, zero, because they are zero in the gender effect, they are men, they are zero in the race effect, they are white people. Our white women, oh, I should, I should actually define these variables. So we're going to have uh, our indicator variable for gender and our indicator variable for race in that order, right? So white women are going to be one in the gender variable, zero in the race variable. Is the order important? Only because you need one of them to be one and one to be other in order to be consistent, right? right? I've written them in that order because I've put gender first and then race up here. Yeah. You can swap the order of them, but you have to do it the whole way down. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. So for black men, you want to guess? Zero, one. Yep. Oh, thank God. Sorry. <laughs> it takes me, it can take me a long time to get stats students to think about this. <laughs> so that's a relief. And for black women, we get one, one, right? So for white men, you're only going to see the baseline because everything else is multiplied by zero. For white women, you see the baseline and the gender effect. For black men, you see the baseline and the race effect. And for black women, you see the baseline, the gender effect, the race effect, and the interaction term where you have both gender and race. Yeah. Presumably, though, for an outcome like wealth, it wouldn't be as a fixed or binary as, zero, as one and zero, right? Like This is where these actual effect terms come into play. Because you have your zero, one variable to say this shows up, but your gender, your race, your gender race effect, and your baseline are all other variable, uh, like other numbers. Yeah. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to invent some data here. Okay, so let's say that this is pretend data, but let's run with it. So the average wealth for white men is, un is 10. The average wealth for white women is 8. The average wealth for black men is 7. And the average wealth for black women is 4.5. So our baseline would be 10 because that's the average wealth of the white men. So I'm going to rub out baseline up here and write the number 10. All right. Now, if you're a white woman, that's the gender effect at play. And you have, on average, two less wealth than a white man. So this is your gender effect. And instead of just being eight, you're subtracting two off the baseline. So you get a minus two. Mm -hmm. So this is IG times minus two. I'm going to put that in parentheses, because we're going to rewrite this in a second to be neater. For race, we look at black men, who are at 7 compared to 10, so the race effect on its own is minus 3, which I'm going to put in here very delicately. All right, now we look at the gender race effect. So what we do for the black women is we say, okay, so we're subtracting off 2 because they're women, we're subtracting off 3 because they're black, which would give us 5, if there's not a gender race effect, but we actually see 4.5, which means that it is below what we would see without that interaction. Yep. So the interaction is a further negative a half. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to put that in as well. And just to like, uh, just to be pedantic, I would say that the race effect in real yep. life is probably a, a much <laughs> a much greater. Uh... Oh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, these are completely made up, right? This is it's bigger than that. Yeah. So it's negative one and a half. Okay, I'm going to rewrite this to be slightly neater down here. So we have 10 is our baseline. I'm going to write minus 2 times the indicator for gender, minus 3 times the indicator for race, minus a half times the indicator for gender times the indicator for race. Mm -hmm. I've made up these numbers as mentioned, but statisticians have rigorous ways to get estimates for these effects. We also have rigorous ways to test a hypothesis that looks like there are structures of wealth inequality for race and gender, which actually means we look at these numbers and we go, is that zero? Because if there is actually no effect of a difference in gender, then the number that you multiply the indicator for gender by would be zero. We can test that quite rigorously based on data, and like we have good ways of doing this. If we are looking at the interaction and we are asking, is there an interaction between race and gender, we look at this number that multiplies the interaction. 
we can quite rigorously define a quantitative test for these different systems of inequality. And would you believe that when you actually go out and run these sorts of tests on huge numbers of social outcomes, I'm talking about a very like abstract definition of wealth, but you look at income, you look at like a lot of health metrics, these things do exist. These inequalities and the interactions do exist. Certainly. Another thing that you can do is you can look at the sign of this, by which I mean, is it a positive or negative? So if it's negative, then it represents a decrease in the outcome compared to the baseline group. If it's positive, it represents an increase in compared to the baseline group. So if you want to change this so your baseline group is black women instead, what you would do is you would see everybody else has an increase on wealth compared to black women who would be treated as the baseline, and your interaction term would be looking at white men instead of black women would also be positive in that context. Yeah. Would there be any meaning to that, like in terms of like how that would like come out in the wash? The interpretation is exactly the same in the sense that what you would be saying there is instead of all of these being negative, because you have white, so you have black women as your baseline group, all of these, we call them coefficients, all these numbers would be positive. Yeah. And we would just say that all these other groups have more wealth than black women. Yeah. And instead of saying all these other groups have less wealth than white men. Yeah. The reason I wouldn't pick something like white women, so some like a white women or black men to be the baseline group, is because then the interpretation of what direction things go gets a little bit tricky. Yeah. The, the maths will give you exactly the same relationship but the way that it reads can be harder to interpret. Another example that fits this simplified social structure is looking at the people police murder in the US. You can look at the per capita police killing rate for white people and black people, men and women. It'd be pretty reasonable to expect, based on what we know about race gender, to think that white women are the least likely to be killed by cops, black men the most likely. You can build a model for this, and boy is it true. <laughs> <laughs> it's so bad. Like, oh, I, fuck. I once got into an argument with some dipshit on Facebook. I think this was about 2011, 2012. Somebody who I um, knew from back in my gamer forum days and have since deleted, <laughs> who was basically telling me that because the total number of white people killed by police in the US is higher than the total number of black people killed, that means that there is, no, in fact, no inequality in police killings. The, the problem with that is, right, there's a slightly bigger white population in the US than there is a black population. Dear listener, um, we are very different people, Tess and I, but one thing that we have in common is remembering Facebook arguments from 2012. <laughs> Look, I, I think I had just joined Facebook in 2012. <laughs> I was a little bit behind the, the ball for that one. So this is why you would look at like a per capita or something that's adjusted to account for different population sizes. Yeah. You can't just look at the total number. I think we had a discussion of that way back when we looked at like population statistics in the third or fourth episode. I can't remember. But anyway, you look at this stuff on a per capita basis because that could account for having a larger or smaller population. Yeah. Using this sort of a model, shockingly, we find that intersectional feminism is not only statistically rigorous, it's testable across many different structures as you like, even if originally it had to be used in that kind of qualitative fashion rather than such a quantitative one. I want to add a layer of complexity here and talk about the mathematical representation of an interaction. I mentioned that if you have two numerical variables, it's not quite an intersection, did I mention that? <laughs> no. Okay. All right. Let's go back to here. Right? <laughs> so what we've got here is categorical data, right? We have categories of people, some of which overlap. If instead of that, what you have is some numerical input. So let's say wealth is an input variable rather than an outcome variable. We can categorize wealth into different classes, into income brackets, that sort of thing. But in general, it's not. So you can look at numerical inputs which scale as opposed to binary categories as inputs. In that context, we don't get this kind of overlapping intersection. We have an interaction. And this is also why we call these things interactions, because we just have kind of two numbers going in in relation to each other. 
I think I get that. Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a little bit more clearly because I'm going to write out another mathematical model. So let's imagine we have an outcome, which is life expectancy at birth. And what we're looking at is our baseline, which I'm going to write B0. I'm introducing notation now. Ooh. <laughs> we're going to add our uh, first input variable. The effect is going to be labeled B1. Uh, this is our baseline. And this is going to get multiplied by the per capita GDP, right? So this is kind of like a country effect, except we're using a actual metric for country wealth. Not necessarily a great one, but it is one. And then we're going to have another effect. So this is the effect. And we're going to multiply that by individual wealth. And we're going to have our third thing, which is the interaction. Now, how that interaction gets represented is we multiply per capita GDP times individual wealth. Now, these are not indicator variables anymore. They're actual numbers. So the effect size is now these B1, B2, B3. I need another arrow. Hang on. Whoop. There. Now it can look real ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so we have something that represents the wealth of the country in which you live, something that represents your individual wealth within that country, and an interaction between the two, represented by this multiplication here. A note on interpreting the B values here. Each B, B1, B2, B3, B0 doesn't change, right? Because it's got nothing multiplying it, it's the baseline. It represents the change in your outcome from adding one to the attached variable. If your per capita GDP goes from $20 to $21, you're going from B1 times 20 to B1 times 21, which is an extra copy of B1. Right. B1 times 20 plus B1. So this change here whoop, is the same for any increase of one. It doesn't matter if it's 20 to 21, 300 to 301, 40,000 to 40,001. It's always B1 that gets added if you increase the value by one. The same applies to the individual wealth. If you go from $40,000 in individual wealth to 40001 you add B2 because it's the number that you're multiplying your individual wealth by. I'm assuming this is standardized, the same currency, whatever. This is where it gets a bit messy because you don't expect a single dollar to really make a difference. So the actual effect size, the B1, B2, it's going to be pretty small. Yeah. But over a whole population, it can still be identifiably not zero and represent a large impact when you're comparing wealth between someone with very little in a poor country and some rich asshole like Elon Musk. So is there some way of calculating GDP across nations, you know? Like, is. Yeah, yeah. So usually per capita GDP is a national statistic, or did you mean within a country have different amounts of GDP? I mean, kind of both, because you could see it like uh, different areas having different GDPs, but you can also see it like in an international sense. Like, um... Yeah, so I'm imagining this as an international sort of model. Yeah. So you have your, I am from this rich or poor country based on your per capita GDP, which as mentioned, is not necessarily a great representation of actual like country infrastructure and wealth or whatever else, but that's another discussion to have. Sure. I, in my head... The variation across a country is more represented by the individual wealth. So what I'm really looking at here is I'm kind of saying, okay, I expect there to be a difference in life expectancy between wealthy countries and poorer countries, but within those countries, I'm probably going to see a higher life expectancy for wealthy individuals as opposed to poor ones. Sure. Yeah, and having these two different kind of metrics is a way of getting access to that. So this is an oversimplified model, which is not very realistic, but we can still use it to interrogate this interaction structure. I have encoded this as a multiplication, which is a very specific sort of mathematical structure. It's the most common one for this sort of thing, but it makes some assumptions. I'm not going to stuff around with the sorts of scales you get when you look at money and look at some raw numbers instead. If we have, let's go A times B, right? A being some number for GDP per capita, B being some number for um, individual wealth. If I just have that on its own, then I don't actually need those brackets. 
then that's what I'm going to see. But if we increase a by 1, we get a plus 1 times b. I'm going to keep the multiplication here for a second, which is going to be a times b plus b, right? By increasing it by 1, I have in fact added a copy of b here. Yeah. Now I'm going to increase b by 1 as well. So I get a plus 1 times b plus 1. Now this is going way back to like year 8. I have to cross multiply. So I multiply a by b. I get a b times b. Sorry, I'll keep those in. I multiply 1 by b. This is your crab claw things, if you remember those. <laughs> so I get another copy of b. Then I multiply uh, a by 1. So I get a copy of a. Then I multiply 1 by 1. So I get a copy of 1. Now I'm not just adding b and a, I've got this 1 hanging around. And I've only increased each by 1. To be a genuine multiplication effect, this structure has to hold for all values of a and b. Because we're statisticians, we don't expect it to be perfect, we have some metrics for error, blah blah blah, but this has to be the sort of structure. If instead, when you multiply a plus 1 and b plus 1, you get a times b plus a plus b, I've just swapped the order of a and b there, uh, addition does not care about ordering, there's no 1 on the end here, this is no longer straight multiplication. So this is no longer an interaction that is represented by this kind of multiplication structure. This is a very real question within these kind of statistical models, and um, I haven't said it yet, but this is a linear model, multivariate linear model, which is usually about second year statistics, so you're doing really well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I like 70% understand it. I'm not... <laughs> that's good. That's a, that's a credit. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is, like, it can be quite difficult to check what the actual structure is across the whole data set that you're working with, but often we will assume that this is what that interaction behaves like, and it doesn't have to be. The real world is unfortunately not governed by my mathematical convenience, which sucks and it's very rude, <laughs> but you know, I can't do anything about that. So when you are looking at these kind of intersectional statistical models, interactional statistical models, you have to be a little bit careful about that. If you're just doing this category thing, it's a bit more straightforward. This gets wildly more complex as soon as you expand beyond having to groups within each category, you can still do it, it's just a royal pain in the ass to understand. And what you usually do in that context is you test a whole bunch of individual hypotheses to ask, okay, is there a structure of inequality between these two groups, on these two groups, what does that look like across all of the groups within a category, what are my interactions? This sort of thing is a little bit more, um, when you're looking at these interactions in depth, that's a little bit more kind of mathematically complex. And uh, that kind of paranoia doesn't necessarily show up, I guess, in a lot of these kind of statistical models built using these sort of linear structures. In general, your interactions are usually just kind of stuck in there as a multiplication as opposed to somebody going, now hang on, I need to make sure that's actually how it works. I have a final political point to make about interactions and intersections within social structures. The reality of intersectional politics, feminist and otherwise, because it is real, it's measurable, and you can do rigorous testing of it, this should be used to build solidarity and build power in order to overthrow systems of oppression. To me, that means both a recognition of a common struggle, but also that in a given movement such as feminism, you should probably foreground people who experience multiple forms of oppression because if what you actually care about is equality and not just your own position, that will allow more equal outcomes overall. I see disability as one of the biggest things in this because so many discussions about, I mean, feminism 
and race fail to account for the hugely varying and typically greatly more disadvantaged positions that like people with disabilities have. So this is something we're going to talk about more next week when we have an episode on is your boss screwing you and how much by <laughs> when we talk about like the fact that you can legally just underpay people with disabilities in Australia and a bunch of other countries because they're considered to be not as productive. Yeah. Those systems of inequality, the fight for the eradication of the gender wage gap, well, if we're looking at income inequality, that it can't stop there because people with disability are greatly more disadvantaged by those structures than just women. And I would also add like that there is some subjectivity to be like uh put back into the put back into this model. Yeah, absolutely. Like, for example, like I think like a lot of like black people have no have noticed that the things that advantage white people in terms of masculinity and that kind of thing sometimes can disadvantage black people in in exactly the same position because they're then seen as threats, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the the kind of structure around black men being like killed so often by police in America is precisely that sort of an interaction, right? Because yeah. you see masculinity associated with power and strength and violence, which in the structure of hierarchy gives men power, but in the context of police killings makes black men more of a threat. Absolutely, yeah. From a practical perspective, a movement fighting oppression needs all the people it can get. That means that in a fight against oppression of any form, a movement has to recognize, acknowledge, and deal with the way that people within it can have different experiences of the same discrimination because of other structures if it wants to have any real success. I want to talk about the experience of trans people within feminism, then both trans and bisexual or pansexual people within the broader LGBTQIA movement in this sort of a context. Trans women experience sexism for not being men, and further sexism for not being cis, as well as an interaction between the two, because trans women are a specific group of people who are targeted for discrimination and violence because of their gender. Trans men also experience violence and discrimination, but in it's, it's in a slightly different way. TERFs, and I mean specifically the people who call themselves feminists here, are unwilling to recognize either their own bigotry or the way that trans women experience feminine gendered violence in no small part because TERFs are unwilling to give up their position as the most disadvantaged group within a gender structure. So they are so used to seeing patriarchy as disadvantaging them as women, they cannot see how patriarchy interacts with cis normative sort of structures to disadvantage trans people as well. Turf denial of the existence of trans men and non-binary people is slightly different, but along similar lines. Trans men are typically rendered invisible by TERFs, who are so focused on excluding trans women that they often perceive things like inclusive language around childbirth as focused on trans women when it's about trans men. <laughs> There's this wonderful cartoon, I think it was I saw, where like a TERF is screaming about something like like terminology around chest feeding and parents and children rather than mothers, mothers and children and things. Yeah. And they're screaming at a trans woman who's just sitting there reading a book and behind the trans woman is a trans guy just like, oh, I'm going to get you. <laughs> <laughs> Ironic in some ways that a feminist movement which is focused on separating biology from power structures would give birth to these very bioessentialist assholes. There's an overlap in the treatment of trans people within LGBTQIA spaces as well, not least because of the overlap in people due to some lesbians also being TERFs, or some bi people also being TERFs and whatever else, and seeking to exclude trans women from lesbian spaces. The dating app quote unquote for women called Giggle is a prime example of this, which claims to use a facial recognition algorithm to exclude trans women. This is both bigoted and extremely funny, because I know of a number of trans women who tested the barrier and got accepted into the app based on like profile pictures and things, as well as reports existing of cis women who have been rejected. Among trans men, there are plenty of accounts of transphobia from cis gay men as well, as well as transphobe lesbians who will try to convince trans men that they're just really just butch women, or decrying of gender care for straight trans men as literally violence against butch lesbians. Which is just delusional and fucking depressing, to be perfectly honest. It's grim. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah, and, and 
this is not building solidarity to overthrow oppression, right? This is infighting and inward-directed bigotry that weakens the movement overall and leaves these broader structures in place. Isn't it funny how much TERFs have suddenly discovered that the people they're talking to are, like, fascists and shit, and actually hate women too? Not that they like women, but, you know. I don't know. The more ideologically committed uh, are not that, uh, not complaining about, about, about it as much as they uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it's like, well, no, it's kind of funny how um, I have seen a couple of comments from TERFs, particularly in the UK and things, saying that basically they've alienated everybody else and now the only people who are willing to talk to them are like incredibly sexist. Yeah. It's like, gee, I fucking want that. <laughs> the one thing I will say, though, is I highly recommend the book Women, Race and Class by Angela Davis. It came out in the 70s, it didn't, uh, so it it sort of doesn't like uh, tip into the more uh, LGBT stuff. IQ and trans yeah, yeah. stuff as much. But what it does do is outline the racism within very early feminist movements. And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a very good book. I know theory is annoying, but it's very readable <laughs> and it's very good. I highly recommend mm -mm. it. So it's very interesting to look at like the this kind of suffragette stuff. Because you go to places like England and America and you look at the sort of if you will, suffragette propaganda, I guess would be the term for it, but like articles, cartoons, advertising campaigns and all the rest of it. And so much of it is basically like, these black men can vote. Why can't I, a delicate, sensible, educated white woman? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. For pansexual and bisexual people, rather than seeing the shared experience of homophobia... Uh, with, like, gay and lesbian people as grounds for solidarity. Some gay and lesbian people see bi and pan people as unworthy partners because they might abandon a same-gender partner in favour of someone from another gender, or perceive the assumption of heterosexuality applied to such people when they're in hetero relationships as a form of privilege instead of erasure. It's a bit like the just a phrase bigotry that gets directed at us. Certainly people assume that I am a straight woman when I'm out with my male partner. It does offer me some protection, but it's not necessarily like a good thing for me, if you will, right? For sure. All of these divisions, all of these conflicts within the LGBTQIA population serve to undermine efforts to overcome discrimination on the bounds of gender and sexuality on the whole, because you're discriminating on the grounds of gender and sexuality. <laughs> you can't pick and choose if you really want those structures to change. This is extremely obvious in the case of TERFs, like hanging out with right-wing sexist assholes, which, I mean, look, they made their bed, they get to lie in it and get increasingly uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, we have a mailbag. Oh boy, this is a doozy. Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you just read the title. So for the audio only, the title of this chart is Wokeness and Charter School Regulation. The x-axis is a state charter school law score, the y-axis is a woke score. This comes from uh, the anti-woke assholes at the Heritage Foundation via a guy called Jay Green, PhD, and uh, Ian Kingsbury. I, I stole this one from Jay Green's Twitter, I believe. You say anti-woke. No, that's ideologically conservative. Let's not, like, fuck around <laughs> with this. Hey? The Heritage yeah, Foundation. Yeah. We know what they're about. Like, it's not... Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're about white heritage. <laughs> <laughs> we can see that we've got these X and Y axes. So these are two scores, both of which are fascinating exercises in quantitative bullshit. I mean, like... I had to fucking dig for these, and it's it's just a fractal of awful garbage. I would also like to put my great amusement on the record that this comes from a report which claims that schools in the US are, quote, eradicating academic standards in the name of equity because, my guy, I would fail this at a quantitative sociology subject for inventing meaningless bullshit. Again, if I was writing propaganda, though, I'm not going to stick to the statistics too, like, uh, <laughs> clearly. No, because they don't agree with them. I'm also really upset about this trend line, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> so this first metric of state charter school law is about how much charter schools are expected to adhere to state and federal standards for education. It's important to know in this context that charter schools are basically being used as a political tool to degrade the education of poor people in communities with large populations of people of colour by putting those kids into environments where they don't have the opportunity to learn anything, 
Their teachers are blocked from being in unions in various ways, grossly under-resourced. They are not given an education pretty much at all. The generational effects of this will be felt for a very, very long time. Removing the requirement that these charter schools adhere to minimum education standards is part of that. And this kind of structural analysis is, of course, missing from the Heritage Report. The actual origins of this metric are basically about parent choice, which means there are no state standards, because that would be imposing on parental freedom. Even if, as a result of the existence of charter schools, there are no public schools in New Orleans anymore, and parents don't have a choice for their poor black kids to go to a school which will actually give them a solid education. I don't understand how charter schools actually work, though. Is that shit... Like, do you have to pay to go? Yeah, so the um, originally, yes, but as a result of basically having a bunch of um, people in government who were, were either taking money from literally owned or otherwise ideologically aligned with these interests, a lot of these are now set up with a voucher system, right? which is always great. For sure. So basically what happens is that you have one voucher for your kid, that means that wherever the kid goes to school, the school will get money for that child. But say you're in New Orleans, where there's no public education, right? Yep. So you get your voucher, and you send your kid to mm -hmm. a charter school, and they get expelled for whatever reason. Yes. Probably. What are your options? What are your options there? It's just, just like, nah, they're uh, not getting an education. Another charter school, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right. So but there <laughs> are, because I was a huge nerd and never did anything in school, I've never really interacted with school expulsion stuff. Yeah. So I don't know how that works, but I, my guess would be that you basically get shuffled around different charter schools because, like, you have to get accepted into them. Now, there is an incentive, of course, for a school to accept a student because they get money out of it. But a lot of these have, even in, in contexts where they also have like public education, they wind up with um, disproportionate numbers of people, of students with special needs. They wind up with disproportionate numbers of students who have like behavioral issues, which may range from needing a bit of extra support to violence. Right. So they're not great work environments either. And of course, because most of these are run for profit, even if they are informally for profit, they are greatly incentivized to not actually provide a good learning environment. Because that shit's expensive, man. Well, you know what's a chilling thought? is that speech that Kamala Harris gave when she was a prosecutor about threatening uh, mothers about truancy and their kids. <laughs> Love thinking about yeah. that. So, well, let's talk about the interaction between uh, black people and wealth for a second. Here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not good. So, like, the use of charter schools in poor communities of color is often advertised by the charter school movement as a good thing. They're like, look, we're providing all these educational resources to these underserved communities. Well, the reason they're fucking underserved is because generations of white supremacist legislators have been stripping money out of the public system. So how this law metric is calculated is not spoken about really in the Heritage Foundation's article. It's deferred to rankings from the Center for Education Reform, which is an interesting think tank ex exercise in providing cover for efforts to destroy public education under the guise of greater opportunity through parental choice. So all of this is framed under the like terms of parental choice, and it's like... Every, every so often I encounter artifacts of American ideology that are just so, like, awful in their implications, but pure in their form, and that is absolutely one of them. You have all these, basically, pictures of di smiling diverse kids and smiling diverse families, and what they are talking about is parental choice and how you know what's best for your children and all this sort of thing. But the actual effects are just fucking awful. Well, you know, like, I don't think we're immune from that in this country. Like, I oh, think no, not in the slightest. The existence of our private school system is um, an abomination, let's oh, say. Oh, sure. But I also think any, any country that is ide ideologically committed to this sort of ide individualism, yes, that is... That works uh, to, as any as a mechanism to just destroy fucking public infrastructure yeah well the healthcare system in australia and the ideas around like oh you have a choice of your private healthcare provider yes, exactly well, like, it's how about <laughs> i actually have good healthcare <laughs> fuck choice nobody's gonna voluntarily choose to not have best healthcare right 
So it's difficult to work out exactly what ranking is used, because the CER has a couple, but I think it's the one they have for regulation of charter schools. So a higher score means fewer regulations and less state control, which is more parental choice under this framework. This aligns with what the chart here is showing, in the sense that Arizona and Florida have the highest score on this, which means that they have the least state control of standards for charter schools. Mm -hmm. The details are shockingly very sparse. How do they calculate that? Fuck knows. So they talk about sorts of things that are required to go into the rankings, like regulatory oversight, what is required to set up a school, like whether you have to get your school approved by a regulator, or you can just tell the government, I am building a school, I will be expecting funding shortly. I couldn't actually find an example calculation anywhere. I don't fucking know what these numbers mean. I certainly don't believe that you can count on a metric from zero to 60. Wokeness? <laughs> oh, we're we haven't even got to the wokeness yet, right? I'm just talking about the x-axis yeah, yeah. here. It's bullshit, right? <laughs> like, if you look at this, right, if it's a ranking, these would be ordered on the x-axis. I think, I didn't count the number of points. I don't think this is all all of the states. So you have your zero to whatever that looks like it's sitting about 13 are just absent <laughs> from this data. So another another complaint, right? You've got two here, which look like they're about 52 to 53. There's not 53 states. So I, well, if you've got DC, okay, that's a territory. But I think even if you include like DC and Puerto Rico, that's only um, 52. Uh, maybe Guam. Yeah. But like <laughs> these, these two here, Idaho and Ohio, I can never fucking remember what these are. Anyway, these are a lot closer together horizontally than these are. I don't know where the fuck these numbers are coming from, and their structure is extremely confusing to me. So anyway, the x-axis is bullshit. Now let's get to the y-axis, which is the wokeness score. This is particularly funny to me, because they use a corpus linguistic technique to actually get that. What they do is they get like publicly available school documents, so these are school charters, for example, and like other statements around like values and things, and they literally count the instances of words like equity, justice, and gender identity. <laughs> Incredible. That's it. That's how they fucking <laughs> calculate this. For some uh, comparative data, I would love to see the same scoring system applied to articles from the Heritage Foundation about wokeness, because I'm willing to fucking bet they would get a really high wokeness score from this, even though they are using those terms in a distinctly negative capacity, or in a meta capacity, right, where they're not, like, saying that justice is a value that we have, but they're talking about instances where justice is used in text. I'm very interested in, like, wokeness when it comes to, like, religious schools, right? Because, I, I don't know, I assume, like, the, <laughs> I assume the Heritage Foundation loves its, like, evangelical schools and all that kind of thing, but... Yeah, well, an awful lot of charter schools are run by religious organizations. Yeah, but I'm thinking, do they like, like, the Islamic schools? Do they like the... I'm going to guess <laughs> no. Because it seems like they'd have similar rhetoric, right? Like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, isn't it shocking how much conservative Christians and conservative Muslims have an aligned values? Hmm. And yet, <laughs> look, I'm not. I'm not even making that claim. I'm just like interested in <laughs> what they think about. Oh that. yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, the Heritage Foundation is deathly opposed to Islamic education. I guarantee those, like as you might imagine, I guarantee where they would find some friction is those conservative Islamic schools would not have like a uh, prosperity gospel bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> no, but they may well have terminology like justice and equity in their documents. I don't know, like. What the con? Would you believe how hard it was to find actual data on this? Oh, no doubt. <laughs> Fuck, has they given me any? So, like, I just have to believe that they did it rigorously. They did not do it rigorously. This cannot be done rigorously. I apologize. I know I'm I'm taking us off course in weird directions, but. Mate, that's what you're here for. Don't don't fucking apologize for doing your job. Come on. I paid you what, like, thirteen dollars <laughs> from the Patreon last year. <laughs> Oh, I forgot to do the Patreon ad at the start. Ah, eh, whatever. So, this workness score is also bullshit. This gives you an example of where these people can kind of invent numbers and be like, look, 
we can see that the trend, look at this trend line, oh, isn't it beautiful and straight? They love a straight thing, is declining. What that means is that groups with lower law school, law scores, law schools, law scores, so that means less independence, if you will, of charter schools to fuck over their students, have a higher wokeness score. Whereas down here, states which have like, quite, um, <laughs> this is going to be an ironic term, liberal approaches to uh, charter school legislation have a very low wokeness score. So that's the sort of result that they're looking for. Of course, there are some outliers here, and this may or may not be a straight line, these numbers are bullshit, I have to wonder how much this scoring system was developed in order to get linear relations. I hate this. I hate it so fucking okay, much. Okay, another weird digression. I'm interested if they'll keep Arizona down there if it keeps getting, like, Democratic governors. So, that depends on what the Democratic governors do. <laughs> like, well, that's not a joke, because there's an awful lot of, like, there's an awful lot of capitalist Democrats, shockingly, right? Oh, absolutely. And they and are not- Arizona is famous for it. I'm not, like, a ruling Yeah, 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 yeah. So, chances are, <laughs> they won't change the charter school law stuff. So, this is not likely to change in that respect, because they're not going to fuck around with the profit motive. Sure. I'm still unclear on whether the Heritage Foundation would like Arizona down there, though, you know? Well, it's not going to like the fact that they're getting Democrats in, in control. I, I think they'll sub in Florida in <laughs> Well, that Florida's right next to it. What do you mean? <laughs> got the got the pair. No, right? Florida's got to be bottom bottom of the line, right? He's uh, DeSantis is in. It's the only place the <laughs> Republicans are winning. Florida's got to be bottom. <laughs> so, aside from my problem with the creation of these underlying numbers, there's another extremely glaring problem with this, which is scores are ordered. Scores are not metrizable in the sense that you can't. You can't say that a difference between a score of 5 and a score of 6 is the same as a difference between a score of 10 and a score of 11. So, whatever the fuck is going on with these numbers down here, however they think those are reflected in a ranking, that's not an actual number for the purpose of a regression, for example, which is what this trend line is. This is a linear regression model. What I could do, for example, is set up a ranking of best to worst vibes from a website, which means the Heritage Foundation would be well on the worst vibes end. Measure that against the good that I think an organization does in the world, and that will let me prove that the Heritage Foundation needs to be destroyed. <laughs> Salt the earth, burn the buildings, you know, so on and so on. I'm thinking all the, like, crank left-wing websites at the top, your <laughs> grey zones, your, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, fuck knows there's enough of them too. <laughs> Alright, that is everything for today. If you, dear listener, have something you would like us to talk about, please do violence to my eyes and send it to us through Twitter or email, details are in the description, and uh, please give us money on the Patreon. We have a Patreon. It is patreon.com slash statistically insignificant, where you can help pay for my time not spent teaching students actual statistics in a classroom, or otherwise melting my brain in various ways. But thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, as ever. And I, I'm going to plug my Twitter again, just because I like to yep. do it every few months in case we get a stray listener. <laughs> At Snitch and Orwell with no G. That is also in the description below. Yeah, yeah. Hell yeah. All right. See you next time. See you then.